All right. So welcome to Journey to Supermind, uh, our collaborative reading of Sri Aurobindo's The Life Divine, uh, which we're hosting through uh, Metapsychosis Journal and um, I'm conducting through our discussion forum at Infinite Conversations. And we're here with a group of readers, and um, we're going to begin this conversation, which is an introductory conversation. There's no required reading uh, for this talk. This is a chance for us to sync, sync up with each other as co-readers uh, and also to set the stage for the reading to come and for other participants who may want to, to join in or maybe following this, this, these videos or watching them even much later. Uh, so we'll begin with a, a, a short meditation period. Uh, it will be silent. Uh, I'd like to go for five minutes and then uh, ring a bell. And if anybody wants to volunteer to be the, the timekeeper and the bell ringer, uh, please do so. And then I'll begin with some uh, opening remarks. And after mine, uh, I'll invite uh, each of us individually uh, to offer our own remarks. And if you don't have anything to say or don't want to say anything, that's okay as well. Uh, the point is not necessarily that everybody speaks, but that everybody's present and that we are present in our listening as much as in our, in our speaking. And um, with that, uh, and before we start the meditation, I wanted to share uh, a few suggestions, uh, guidelines for how we might conduct a conversation like this, which is um, not only I would, I would say attempting to read a text and discuss it in intellectual terms, but, but also to um, practice with it and to bring its truth, uh, its ideas, uh, its own suggestions into, into play and see what we can do with them. Um, so I have a couple of... Um, suggestions uh, for how we could do this and we can work with this we can revise it we could evolve it etc this is just a starting point uh, this comes from a friend who uh, received uh, the invitation email and, and wrote back uh, he wasn't uh, able to participate with us but uh, he made these suggestions about quote unquote an invoking intersubjective supramental non-duality on conference calls and that sounds like a mouthful but I think you know, we could just think of that as a, a good conversation or a, a flow in our conversation. Uh, point one is to draw everyone's attention to moments of shared silence rather than people instinctively filling or obscuring the silence, which amplifies, which amplifies group awareness of, quote, prior unity. Um, two, encourage participants to follow the thread of the conversation, building on and deepening what was said before, rather than injecting egoic non sequiturs. Uh, and then three, ensure that everyone participates and doesn't hold back, self-contract, no matter how shy. Uh, active, engaged listening can count as a minimum baseline. So that was um, what I was referring to earlier. And then he uh, offered us this um, blessing, may the consciousness force be with you. So uh, with that... Uh, let's do a meditation. And do we have a volunteer for a uh, timekeeper or bell ringer? If not, I can do it. Mateo? Okay.
Okay. I'm going to see if I could um, begin with the, the simplest truths that I can um, communicate uh, at the moment and try to build from there. Uh, my name is Marco, as uh, you all know, others may not, Marco Morelli. And at this moment, I'm, I'm sitting in my studio, a uh, little room, a little building, uh, behind my house. You may hear my daughters playing in the backyard uh, between the studio and, and the house. I'm in Longmont, Colorado. And I guess the reason I'm here is because for the last uh, couple of years, uh, and, and prior to that uh, as well, uh, I've been engaged in a process of um, talking with, working with, communicating with other people, like the ones who are all here, uh, on questions that are um, dear to me and that I feel and experience passionately. Uh, those include like fundamental questions like, who am I? Um, but they also have to do with creation with what I'm doing, what I'm making uh, in this world, or what I'm contributing to. And with how to make my way, how to be in this world. And so I was reminded um, that five years ago, I organized a reading group. It was the first time that I had done uh, one of these kinds of events. Uh, it was just this time of year. It was uh, May uh, of 2013. And I had been going through a period of, of turmoil, great inner turmoil, uh, as I was emerging out of a um, set of relationships or an episode in my life uh, that... Um, had me, I would say, uh, feeling very suppressed, very kind of tied up in a knot, very uh, <clears throat> suppressed almost by um, inner forces, you know, by being by by a, by a sense of capture, you know, by uh, of my mind or of my own essence or of my own being, of my own consciousness, uh, and. It was a capture of mind by mind. It was a, a mental capture. It was uh, a set of ideas that I couldn't shake, shake out. And they had to do with integral theory and integral philosophy and had to do with my, you know, my um, apprenticeship or my, my coming of age, in a way, um, through working with uh, another integral philosopher who most of you are probably familiar with, Ken Wilber, uh, through whom I learned about Sri Aurobindo originally through Ken's... Um, summarizations and his orienting generalizations. Uh, and I came to a point in 2013 where I wanted to go in another direction. I wanted to do something different. I felt that the systematization uh, that had become prevalent um, in that particular community, uh, and in, my, you know, in my networks and people that I knew and cared about and loved, um, had itself become a way of a, a boundary uh, that 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 needed to be in some way transcended, and and I found a pathway to doing that through reading, through literature, uh, through writing, uh, and this you know was you know I've been a meditator, uh, spiritual practitioner for over twenty years since uh, college. Uh, but I needed to engage in a, another kind of practice. And so uh, five years ago, uh, I um, organized a reading group for the, the novel Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace. It's a huge book, 1,000 pages with all these footnotes, uh, very complex and um, 
uh, dramatic. Uh, he's a brilliant writer. Uh, and we worked, Mark Jabor uh, was, was in that group. That's where we, how we met uh, here in Colorado. Uh, we met in person as well. And uh, an amazing thing happened in that experience, which is that people came forth. People brought themselves forth. And the novel and the experience of reading the book together, taking on a, a big challenge, really, a, challenge, a, a book that many people start and put down and never, and never come back to, uh, that seemed to inspire a kind of solidarity, a kind of uh, love of life, I think, a love of each other, love of our humanity, uh, and a love, I would say, also of what is maybe even deeper than that. That's part of what Wallace was, I think, touching on. Um, and it inspired me to continue. How could I do, how can I continue doing this? How could I do more of this? And out of that, a number of, I've had a number of experiences and uh, a vision arose. Uh, and the vision was that I would help bring forth a, a platform, a cultural platform, a platform for culture, a platform for actual engagement with the essence of a text, the essence of art, the essence of philosophy, the essence of spirituality, all of these, you know, all this, this culture means something. And it's not just a consumer object. It's not just something to buy and consume and tweet about. It calls for a deeper engagement. And so out of that the vision, uh, the vision distilled into these various projects. Uh, one of them is the journal Metapsychosis, the online journal, uh, which we have co-editors uh, of here and contributors to here, uh, the forum Infinite Conversations, and uh, a cooperative organization called Cosmos, Cosmos uh, Cooperative, which are all in formation. And there are these, these unfolding seed potentials coming into, into being through these events. And through the exchanges that that we have and the um, the experiences, I think that that we um, that we undergo uh, together, and people come have come and gone and come through and sort of spun in different directions. And I've been confused many times. I've often felt like I don't know what I'm doing, uh, but something has been guiding it all along. Uh, has been guiding me. I've been following my own thread, as I think all of us are in our own ways. And, uh, and it now brings us to this moment uh, where uh, the proposal is to, like, like we did with Infinite Jest five years ago, to read another uh, long work, a, a, a deep work, uh, a very different kind of work, certainly, uh, than, than, than Wallace's. And, and to, um, to make something of it, you know, to, to, to bring it into our lives and um, to, I think, enact a creative fulfillment. Uh, I see, I orient toward these events as an artist, as a writer, as a poet, as a spiritual aspirant. Uh, and so... Um, I'm so glad that you all are here because, uh, it, because it means that my very particular, you know, being, my partic very particular you know, way of seeing the world and experiencing things gets to um, learn from and interact with a whole number of other very particular ways of being and experiencing things and I think mutually enrich uh, each other. Uh, and bring forth something that's it's inclusive of our individuality and our uniqueness, but it also transcends it and, it and it moves into, I think, a, perhaps as Aurobindo is saying, we'll get into this, a harmonization of, of our existences. And so to me, that is a wonderful thing to do. I think it's, uh, I think, I think we need it, <laughs> frankly. Uh, uh, and I, I don't just mean us particularly, but it's sort of needed. 
uh, it's, it's, uh, that's, that's the feeling that I'm having just beginning to, t- uh, to dip my toes into the water of these texts that there is a lucid vision here. There is a grand and lucid vision here about the nature of the cosmos and our, and our paths in it. And, uh, I'm, I'm eager to explore that, uh, with you. And I'm eager to hear how you each are, you know, orienting to this. Like, what do you um, bring to it? What do you hope to get out of it, to put it in kind of conventional terms? Uh, and anything is okay. Like, I, I think that that's one of the, for me, it will be one of the um, edges of my own kind of growth is uh, letting, it be, letting, my, letting it be okay to be me and to also plumb all the infinite depths of what that me is. Because I think it also includes you and us and it. And, um, and so uh, my invitation is just for you to do the same or the similar in your own way, uh, whatever that means. And for us to co-create a space where that's okay. Uh, and to you know, read this text and enjoy it. Because there's, I think, also much bliss <laughs> to, to, be, um, to be found uh, in, these, uh, in this offering. So, um, this kind of, the, the idea to read this has come out of conversations with folks who are here uh, with us right now. And um, so, I want to start with them uh, because they're kind of closest to, I think, the ontogenesis of this moment. And then, and then kind of spiral out so that we, we get through everybody. And then I want to ask, you know, what is the relevance of reading Aurobindo now? Why, why would we do this? Uh, and um, and then later, like, let's talk about how, because I think I mean, given that we're all over the world in different time zones, in our own contexts, it's been a, uh, it's a great challenge to, to synchronize and harmonize just on the logistical level. And so there's some, I think, uh, indeterminacy there. And I want to work with that and get in sync on, on it. And I think we can. Uh, so uh, let's begin uh, with, John. <laughs> and you're muted. Okay, great. Nice to see everyone here. It's very exciting for me. I've tried reading this a couple of times, but I got bogged down and very distracted. I live in Manhattan, and it's, um, you know, it's a... It's a very fast-paced and borderline hysteria most of the time. Uh, I do have my own, you know, meditation practice, and over the years I've cultivated uh, many different kinds of practices. Um, but what I found is uh, the communal uh, space, if it's uh, if, if it's compatible, is actually the most effective way of. Um, stabilizing and integrating um, a lot of the experiences that I've had. And um, in my experience here, I've met most of, I, I know many of you, uh, we've, we've done reading groups before, and I, I met Kim, I think, in, at a Gebser conference uh, last November. And it seems like um, this particular uh, book seems to attract us. So I'm really curious about the relational field that will be opened up. And I find that helps me um, focus my attention. So I think uh, the quality of our intention, intention and our attention is extremely important when dealing with a text like this. So I'm very excited about mixing it with, with energy as well, which I think was one of your suggestions, Mark. So anyway, that's my two cents. Thank you all. Glad to be here. You're muted, Marco. So, 
go ahead and speak. Um, I came about the infinite conversation site about six months ago. Um, I think it was a search on Gebser. I was interested in finding out more about that fella. Um, but uh, while doing that, I came across a few individuals. Uh, TJ is one who is not here right now, but he's kind of the one that started the whole, hey, maybe we should uh, work on our Obindo. I've been interested in the human cycle uh, and the life divine. Um, so that right there kind of intrigued me. I have read um, the life divine. I, if anybody asked me about it, I probably couldn't tell you. <laughs> Uh, more than a couple sentences, of, but it, it deeply impacted my life. Uh, it was maybe about 10 years ago that I, I did read it. And this was a time... Sorry, I have my son here. Did you want to say anything? No, you can't go to sleep. Um, but I'll, I'll keep it a little short so maybe I can take care of this issue. But I live in Frankfurt, Kentucky. I consider myself an undercover agent of sorts. Um, just living in my own sort of bubble here. So the community online, the infinite conversations has really kind of changed my life in a lot of ways to be able to articulate what I'm, what's going on in here. <laughs> so um, I'm really looking forward to communicating with a lot of you, especially uh, I know Wendy was on the bubbles, the slaughter dike conversation there, and I appreciated her insight. Um, but uh, a couple other things about me: I'm very quiet and shy. So I this another reason I enjoy kind of the safe space here is I'm able to articulate what I need to say, or at least have others assist me in that process. Um, so it's been great. Um, so I'm really looking forward to rereading The Life Divine. Um, and we'll probably get into it a little bit later, but I've, there, there might be, like, this is a pretty large group and there, it sounds like there's two or three others that might be interested. So we might, I, I don't necessarily have to read this book again. So if somebody finds interest in another book or something related to Aurobindo, I don't mind attempting to set up uh, a separate conversation, but um, glad to see everyone here. Thank you. Are you, uh, I can't hear you, Marco. I, you I can't hear you either. Oh, sorry. I was I was suggesting Jeffrey, you you go next. So okay. <laughs> So I'm Jeffrey Edwards. I uh, live in Quebec City, um, which is 35 degrees today. So it was a bit hot for May in Quebec City. I don't think I've ever seen it that hot here in May. Um, I'm a scientist, uh, maybe a scientist in the process of becoming a fiction writer. But uh, so that's part of one of the conversations going on around here. Aurobindo is new to me. Um, I came across the references to work through people at this site and in this meeting as well. Um, so it's not a writer I'm familiar with. I haven't read Gebser either, even though many people are quite cognizant about Gebser. And I'm certainly interested in, in reading Gebser more, but uh, I haven't done that yet. Um, but I am interested in sort of Eastern approaches to things and meditation practices and those kinds of things. So it's, it's not entirely out of my area. Um, I was reading today. So I read the first chapter of, or, of the life Define, which, which I found delightful. And I was reading this book, Prophets in Our Midst. Um, by David Johnston, uh, which is kind of interesting because he talks about Jung, Gebser, Aurobindo, uh, and Tolkien, as well as somebody calls the mother, which I guess is the companion to Aurobindo. So it's an interesting mix of references that he uses. 
I made a few comments on the website on the for this uh, meeting today about it in in preparation for the, for the discussion today. So I'm quite charmed with the writing. Uh, I was a bit hesitant about it because a lot of people here are sort of well grounded in integral theory, and for me, it's kind of new, and I don't. I still don't really fully understand it, even though I understand now that there's lots of different flavors of it. And Aurobindo is perhaps his own flavor of this idea of integral theory uh, or integral approach. Um, so, but I, I was very, in, I found the writing very interesting and, and uh, I'm quite eager to go forward with the next, uh, with the reading for the next uh, Segment. So I'm also delighted to see so many people I don't know because that's a, um, you know, that's an open-ended conversation that's really interesting and enriching. So it's always a privilege to take part in these conversations. There's always such incredible richness and complexity that comes out of the exchange. Uh, so I'm always pleased to, to be part of it. I'll pass the... I'll pass the the stone or the baton there. You, you know, before we continue, I, I think I should just uh, fill in a couple of details on like the the conversation that we've been having because we went from infinite jest with Mark Jabour to a reading of Gene Gebser's Ever Present Origin in uh, winter of 2016. So that's kind of in the field, uh, and then. Uh, last summer, we began a reading of the of German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk's trilogy, Spheres. We began with Bubbles, and so some folks here were in that conversation. And then we went, and then this, just up until last month, we were reading uh, Globes. Uh, so there, between, and then we've been doing weekly uh, Cosmos Cafe events. And in these events, we'll read a paper or watch a video. Uh, but we have some topical discussion. And in those events, we've read uh, a, 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 a couple of integral thinkers. One of them is Jennifer Gidley, who, who wrote a paper called uh, Toward a, The Evolution of Planetary Consciousness or something like that, an integration of integral views. And there she compares and contrasts the philosophies of, of Gene Gebser, Rudolf Steiner, and Ken Wilber, uh, and mentions Aurobindo as being insp inspiring to her, but not one that she you know, could bring into her, into her fold uh, at that time. So there's a certain kind of genealogy to this conversation. and We're referring to it uh, in bits and pieces, but, but th that's in the context. So just so that it's, that's clear to anybody watching this. Wendy, would you like to uh, go next? Sure. Um, my name is Wendy. I am in Connecticut. Um, I have a master's degree in consciousness studies and I became acquainted with this group um, when the Gebser book club started. Um, Gebser and the Ever-Present Origin was one of those books I read for graduate school and struggled with. I kept getting up to a certain point in the book and my mind would just explode and I couldn't figure it out. So um, I joined the book club, figuring that if I had a group of people that I could be immersed with and I could talk to about it, I would get past that point and could actually finish the book, which I did. <laughs> um, and then I've stuck around and I'm, I enjoy the company. I enjoy the conversation. Um, I've worked with Marco on metapsychosis and do some editing there. Um, I've edited some pieces for some of you folks. Um, it was part of the bubbles conversation. And when Marco mentioned that Aurobindo was being discussed, um, I was definitely interested in it. I was looking forward to this. Aurobindo is one of those authors that pops up in other texts that I've read and other books that I've read. And it's kind of like, you know, how sometimes there's um, like a quote or a blur before a chapter of a particular author's work and Aurobindo is always in there. Like, it just seems like he's constantly around and you kind of know him like, you know, Michael Jackson, you know, he exists, you sort of know who he is, but you don't know him on a personal level and you've never really dove into what he's written. Um, so this is a good opportunity for that. And I enjoyed that immersive experience, like being able to have a, a text or a book that I can, um, focus on and meditate on, especially when I'm doing other things, because I have a lot of other interests and a lot of other stuff just going on. 
And um, when that gets too crazy, I like to be able to kind of put it away and then just immerse myself in a, something that's complex and something that takes all of my brain. And um, it's, a, it's a nice distraction, but at the same time, I'm learning something. And one of the things that some of the other folks know from the other book clubs that I'm in is I'm, I tend to read a book as if it was written yesterday. Um, like what, what's being written and what am I reading that I can take and use um, in my own experience, my own life? Um, whether that's dealing with other people, dealing with other perspectives, learn, seeing the world through a different set of eyes and figuring out um, how something works based on their view as opposed to my view. So um, I'm really looking forward to the book club and to hearing all of your perspectives and all the experiences that you bring to the work. That's it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Kim. Hey, Marco. Hey. Can you hear me all right? Cool. Um, so I, um, I saw an email in my inbox a couple of days ago and um, like, oh, book club. Oh, Marco. Oh, Sri Aurobindo. I keep hearing that name, so um, I really um, feel very sort of synchronistically sort of uh, appreciative to be here. Um, I had four other competing agenda items on the calendar this evening, so it was one of those moments of truth for me as far as like what's most deeply resonant with me, so that was a little bit of a fun practice to sit with that, although Marco's emails definitely helped to encourage me to be here. So thank you, Marco. Um, so I did the book club with uh, when we did the reading for Team Gepser, and that was a very powerful experience for me, um, both in the reading and also the community to hold the space to both plow through the book, as Wendy was saying, but also to um, uh, really have a space to kind of unpack it and sort of um, let what was happening in, in me to try and sort of comprehend what he was saying and some of the ideas. And so that was a very powerful experience. And so I'm, that set the bar kind of high, not that I have expectations, Marco, but <laughs> um, just really feel deeply uh, uh, excited to be here and pulled in the direction of that type of experience with a different author and one that's um, quite interesting to me. So um, I'm happy to be here and um, to getting to know all of you a little bit better over the coming months. If you don't mind me breaking protocol, what have you been up to since we read Gepser together? Oh, wow. So let's see. Um, shortly after we read Gepser, I went out to go see Muji Baba in London came back and then did a week-long intensive with David Data, to which um, somewhere around that time, I was in the middle of a Black Lives Matter shooting in Dallas where seven police officers were murdered. I was on the ground for that. Um, so a lot of sort of interesting life circumstances sort of seemed to kind of jostle after that. Um, my house was burglarized and everything of my past was stolen. So a lot of interesting sort of churning around in my personal world. Um, professionally, I still work for Siemens Corporation, which is a German manufacturing technology energy industry and infrastructure organization. So I work for them in the IT world. And I also um, help to manage uh, in an advisory capacity my family's uh, security and uh, staffing business. So a lot of corporate and business activities during my day. So this is, uh, I like how one person put it, it was uh, a bit of a sort of undercover <laughs> agent. Um, I'm openly weird. <laughs> Dallas is big enough to, <laughs> to, be, to be a little bit quirky and a little bit weird, although some of my law enforcement contacts for our security business don't really know how to sort of contextualize <laughs> my existence. <laughs> so I, I think I challenge them in a way that they wish that I would just disagree because it just makes their head hurt too bad to kind of understand how I could be totally in a red state and operate in the space that I operate in. So it's a little bit fun. 
So I kind of dance between worlds and um, I also moved into a new house since the last time we talked. So really enjoying the space. I've got nature right outside the front door. So that's what I've been up to. Cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. Cool. Thanks, Margo. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, Derwin. Hi. Hi, Marco. Hi, everybody. Hey, Derwin. Uh, hi, Kim. Uh, 2003 or four at the integral psychology, integral psychotherapy. <laughs> so yeah. It's been I, I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, well, I met Marco in 2011 at, uh, uh, integral incubator in Boulder. Um, and, uh, and I guess, the rest of my genealogy of being here is I was actually born and raised um, in an intentional community called the Emissaries of Divine Light. So uh, with the word divine in there, I thought, well, I better show up for this. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, my parents um, put in 60 years of intentional living between the two of them. Um, and the first 20 years of my life were spent in a communal context as well. So um, that's, you know, about 80 years in this organization, Emissaries of Divine Light, which, believe it or not, still has a headquarters, uh, very kind of, but it's just down the street from Marco there in Loveland, Colorado. Uh, and then more recently, I, you know, I got interested in Ken Wilber's work was the first kind of integral philosopher that I came across uh, about 2001 and was quite involved, um, had been quite involved in integral psychology, um, including, you know, a group of us sort of did a, you know, an issue applying to psychotherapy. So my background is I'm trained as a therapist. Uh, so I've looked at how to apply integral psychology in a therapeutic way. Uh, but in the last year and a half, uh, Muji actually has been really, yay, Muji, <laughs> has been really helpful. So I've really, I really spent the last year, it might have just been a reaction to Trump, I don't know. But I spent really the last year doing several online Muji retreats, um, really just appreciating that non-dual Eastern uh, approach. Um, but now it really feels like a bridge between Wilbur and Muji would be Aurobindo. It just makes sense. Um, it you know preserves that um, that kind of deep Indian sensibility, but adds the evolution piece. Um, so yeah, so that's a bit about kind of where I'm coming from to be here, and uh, yeah, really looking forward to it, and uh, happy to to be here with everybody. And I hope you can hear me okay in terms of volume. I don't know. Sometimes my voice is a little quiet. Um, okay? Cool. Yeah. All right. Good. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark. Jabor. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm here because I got the, the email from Marco. And uh, we've been friends for five years since Infinite Jest. And uh, I'm here out of curiosity and, and because I got an invitation from Marco. But I've been in and out of philosophy and, and psychology for 50 some years. I, uh, I, I, looked at, I, I watched the introduction you had on the email with the two guys talking mm -hmm. about him. And then I watched another, like maybe a 40 minute session from some Indian guru guy uh, talking about Aurobindo. It, Mm -hmm. given background and everything. So uh, I actually feel like I'm pretty familiar with his philosophy just from those two things. 
and because I've studied comparative religions for like yeah, 50, 60 years, I lost a girlfriend to the Hare Krishna movement back in 1971. Uh, so that was interesting in Boston. I dropped her at the temple in Boston. Uh, so I've been around and I'm really here to support Marco. I don't know if I'll, I may read a little bit, but I, I you know, I'll just check it out. <laughs> check it out. There's a song, right? Van Morrison? <laughs> um, Mateo. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Mateo, and I live in Felton, California, which is six miles north of Santa Cruz in the Redwood Forest. And I'm here because I'm not really sure what the link is, but a friend of mine, Eric, sent me Marco's email and connected us. And Marco and I have had one conversation, so I don't really, I don't, I, I have a sense of you all, but it's like, it's, it's an honor to be with uh, people, fellow travelers on the path. And it sounds like there's a breadth of experience and everyone's coming from a slightly different, uh, slightly different background, but same background. And uh, we're drawn together by the life divine and the aspiration to Artistic, to collaborate in the evolution of human consciousness. It's, these are, this is the thing that gets me up in the morning, I suppose. Uh, I'm logistically and professionally, I think I might be a scientist, though I don't uh, always go around identifying as such. I've been more on the business end of things lately. I've been living in Argentina for a while, and I'm kind of just back to California and adjusting. I was uh, part of a startup project, a biotech project, manufacturing antibodies, a project that never got off the ground. So that in, a, in and of itself was a, uh, a fascinating experiment and experience. Uh, regarding Sri Aurobindo, I, uh, I've, I suppose uh, I have been immersed in the works of Sri Aurobindo and the mother for about 15 years or so. And um, yeah, I don't know what quite to say about that. I feel like I'm barely scratching the surface with it, but uh, much of much of my life and energy is spent uh, uh, connecting people around the globe with the center and focus of integral yoga with the, the first chapter. I hear, hear a couple people have read it, the human aspiration, uh, aspiration for God, light, immortality, freedom, omnipotence, uh, the, um, the challenge that he places in front of us to not even have fear to aspire to whatever our imagination, wherever our imagination takes us to aspire. It, uh, it called me pretty strongly in 2003. We, uh, I'm sure most of you recall in 2003, we were uh, pouring French wine into the gutters in Manhattan and renaming French fries, freedom fries. I'm sure you all kind of remember that time. Colin Powell in front of the UN beating the war drums, going into Iraq. And, and, and I met Sri Aurobindo at that time. I kind of say he, he plucked me up and, uh, and then I discovered Savitri. I don't know uh, who, who has touched Savitri, but it's a, it's a, 24,000 lines of mantra filled with yogic consciousness that, that uh, plays with us in ways that nothing I've ever met has, is, is able to. So 
I have a, a just an incredible love and attraction to Sri Aurobindo's writing. And I'm really here because I'm a beginner at all of this. And I'm always looking for another excuse to have a pass through the life divine. Each pass goes, uh, goes an inch deeper. And sometimes I think that that's all I can ask for on the way. So I look forward to connecting with you all uh, more personally and one-on-one, getting to know you over the weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here, Matteo. And um, you, you say you're a beginner, but from our conversation, uh, you know, you've, you've done this kind of thing like we're doing, uh, participating, organizing conversations about Aurobindo's work um, for, for, for some time. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I feel much more like the beginner. <laughs> and uh, so please, you know, feel, please bring, well, you, I, I know you will. I'll shut up. <laughs> um, well, we have a new uh, a guest. Um, and as you may have uh, uh, observed, we're doing introductions. Uh, so uh, I can't tell your name from your handle there. I'll unmute you. Are we trying to unmute? Am I? Are we trying to unmute you at the same time? Can you hear us? Can you? Can you uh, give us a thumbs up if you can hear us? FM Dolan. Okay, so. Perhaps he hasn't joined audio by. Right. Uh, uh, if you can hear us, there's a click on the bottom right hand, on the bottom left that says join audio. All right, I'm going to write a little text. Dolan. And let's continue with introductions um, and I'll come back to, to you. Um, Brian, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm really happy to be here and meet with all of you online. Um, like many of you, I discovered Sri Aurobindo through Ken Wilber's writings as I just discovered integral theory as an undergrad. Um, I did, it wasn't until I went to Montreal in 2012 that I bought a, a book, uh, one of Aurobindo's books at a used bookstore and started reading them. Um, I have a background in philosophy and sociology and psychology, and I've been studying that for the last 10 years. And in the, in the spring, I hope to uh, join the PCC uh, community and apply uh, to do a master's degree there. So yeah, I feel very grateful to be part of this group, and I discovered it in 2016. But I hadn't joined until this, till this time. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, you, you've, uh, have you been following any of the conversations on the forum or? or, or? No, I haven't. I, I've, been. I feel like I've seen your name before around, and maybe. It, yeah, I, I think it through email, probably. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um. There's one left. Hi, Lauren. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. Um, hi, um, my name is Lauren. Um, I'm from, right now I'm in um, North Central Florida. Um, I'm originally from Northern Kentucky. Um, I'm sort of a new to integral theory. I hadn't really heard of uh, these ideas before. Um, I knew a little bit about uh, Sri Aurobindo and um, kind of his ideas about um, how consciousness and like uh, being still evolving. And um, so I'm really interested in these ideas, um, but I'm sort of new to them. So I'm very um, ready to learn and um, I'm excited to meet everyone. And um, 
I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be a part of uh, this community. And I've always uh, kind of admired it from afar and read um, a lot of the articles and, um, you know, kind of read some of the conversations, but I'm excited to actually be a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. And you also left an introduction on the, on the forum. Uh, there's a thread called Personal Introductions, and uh, you mentioned that you've been studying neuroscience, uh, right? And um, Yeah, I, um, I have a bachelor's in uh, neuroscience. I received that in last year, so, um, yeah, I have a little bit of a background in, um, like, psychology and philosophy and some of these ideas. Um, Okay, great. Um, all right, well, let's let's dive in then, uh, shall we? Uh, so it's been about an hour, and I thought we'd go officially for 90 minutes uh, and then leave some buffer after that, um, but also give people a chance if they need to move on to exit at that time. Uh, so... I would like to ask if, if we could begin to articulate or co-articulate. Uh, actually, one more thing on the logistics. I do want to come back then to our reading schedule and things like that. So let's leave like 10 minutes or so before the bottom of the hour to do that. But what I'd like to propose is that we ask, why are we why Aurobindo now in the world that we're in now, in the world that we're experiencing? And that's a kind of broad question. We've, some of us, uh, through our anecdotes, have hinted at the, situa you know, at the aspect of the situation. This, uh, some call it a crisis. Uh, certainly, uh, some call it an accelerating evolutionary process. I mean, there's various ways of characterizing it from the materialistic point of view to the metaphysical point of view and all manner of things in between. Uh, some narratives are driven you know, by, not by knowledge or truth, but by desire for power or profit. But how do we understand all that? This is, I think, part of what Aurobindo is um, writing about. Uh, this is a grand narrative. Like, this is a meta grand narrative. This is... Uh, the kind of thing that um, culturally oh, we don't seem to have a lot of room for. And, um, and if we look at the cultural landscape and competing discourses, competing ideas, uh, it's fierce. Uh, and uh, I don't think any of us can escape the effects of the kind of warfare that's going on on this planet at this time. Uh, whether or not it's overt conventional war, uh, there, is, there is what one might interpret to be a, a kind of mental or psychic war uh, that's um, operating through the media, through the internet, and so forth. We've talked a bit about this. Uh, I don't know if that's really the best starting point because Arbindo takes a very different starting point. Uh, and you know, his starting point, as I understand it, is like 100% spiritual. It, it's not kind of in these kind of discourses. It's a different, very different point of view. So what, so how does that, how is that point of view relevant to us? Uh, I'm, you know, Matteo, you've read this text multiple times already. So, um, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just uh, aware of it secondary, secondhand through Wilbur I did read the first chapter and two two chapters of the Life Divine and tuned in. I've read some you know some other secondary material. I have a sense of his general metaphysics. I, I feel familiar with it, just schematically through through Wilbur uh, and through other um, sources that, that that I've read. But there's something about Aurobindo himself, perhaps the example of his life, the fact that he started a community which is ongoing that is attempting to realize, actualize some of the ideas that, or all of the ideas that, that, that he's writing about. Um, 
there's I think a relevance here, and maybe maybe I may, I may falter in articulating that, but perhaps through some kind of assemb- melan- assemblage or or um, co- create a co-creative process, we can come to a clarity about that. And I wonder what any one might have to say about that, or what they might think. Well, I think, I think for me, Marco, just the fact that somebody can write and sustain a meta narrative is important. I feel when you were saying like an attack on our intellectualism or our, or our mindfulness, it, everything is so shallow. Everything is so condensed. And if you can't put it in 140 characters, it's not worth talking. If it doesn't fit on one piece of paper, it's not worth, it's not developed, you know, and people don't read emails. People don't read period. And you know, like I said in my introduction, I kind of like the idea of being able to delve into a complex, long piece and really get a feel for somebody's thought and watch the thought develop, you know, as the book goes on. So I see this as my own personal defense, my own personal, you know, way in putting something into the world that's not short and condensed and contributing to this very shallow understanding of the world. So this is my little way of combating all that media influence and just the constant noise around. So I think that's why it's relevant right now. Any, any large book with a meta narrative at this point would be relative right now. You know, the fact that it's our window just makes it even better. <laughs> I had a quick comment I just wanted to make. Um, so I, I made the notes it's it's related to the notes that I wrote into the fo- into the into the page underneath this uh, the call for this meeting. So it's this idea that uh, um, the big and the small are actually the same thing. So uh, this, so you're saying what is the relevance of Aurobindo, and it's a grand narrative. Well, it's a grand narrative, but if the big and the small issues are all part of the same issue then the grand narrative is also a micro narrative and it's that relationship between the detail and the larger view that i find is part of what is drawing me to this uh, so yeah. hey hey lauren uh w- welcome hi we- Hi, we've done all our introductions and we were, we were just talking about like why we're reading Aurobindo now. What, what's the relevance of, of this book or of this text? So I think we should continue that and then come back for, uh, kind of at the bot in 20 minutes, if you don't mind, let you introduce yourself yeah. at that point. Cool. All that right. sounds great. I'm okay. Sorry to be late. I got mixed up with the time zone. No worries. Well, I'll, I'll, um, uh, well, I live in Manhattan, and it's a very, you know, consumer, neoliberal capital of the world, I guess. And it's very fast-paced and um, very innovative in some ways. But I'm very frustrated by what I see as a real decline in um, public discourse in general. And... Um, you know, everyone's running around looking into their, their devices and <clears throat> seems like an increase in disenchantment. <clears throat> and so I like the Aurobindo. He's, uh, I don't think he's disenchanted at all. And I find myself very drawn to that because I have a very, very tuned into the magical, what Gebser would call the magical. And um, I've had lots of paranormal experiences from a very young age, um, telepathy with animals and out-of-body experiences. And um, I've had, you know, um, experiences of, uh, you know, absentee kind of healing, um, contacting people on other, other, other planes. And I don't have a particular good uh, vocabulary for any of this and um, 
it's, it always created tremendous cognitive dissonance uh, because, you know, most people just look at you if you bring this stuff up, it's sort of like not very polite conversation or people just sort of think you're a new age kook. So, you know, I get very withdrawn and uh, much rather, you know, just check out and sort of go into hermit mode, which I'm able to do. Um, and, and, you know, it's just a, a pleasure, I think, to be around other people who so, sort of share these, these uh, a curiosity about these kinds of states. And it's, I think, um, has happened in the Gebser reading and I think um, to some extent with the Schlatter die. I got much more comfortable talking in public about these very vulnerable areas of my own uh, psyche, which you know, are, are magical and wonderful, but also tinged with a bit of trauma. I think the trauma part of it is the inability to express in a clear way uh, my experience as with others, uh, because it just seems like we don't have a, a very good uh, handle on this. Um, so these anomalous experiences, I think, are happening to many people, and we tend to sweep it under the rug and ignore it. But I think many of us are living in a, in a very magical and enchanted world, but we just uh, feel inhibited about sharing it in an open way. So I believe a study of Aurobindo would um, help heal a lot of our wounds in that way because he seems to be extremely articulate um, as he's had lots of paranormal ex experiences himself and uh, was very involved in um, exploring those aspects of, his, of our human nature. And I think um, creating some a marvelous map, uh, and I think we we can continue to do that. Um, so that's my two cents. Thank you. Hey, Marco. Um, something that's kind of coming up in the thread of conversation that. I find really interesting and you know this idea of discourse and sort of where we're at in time right now with this sort of volatility that seems to be sort of charged and coming from sort of this polarization um, sort of fed by the media and these sort of mechanisms right uh twitter whatever the social media as well as just our media in general and what i was in uh, banff last week uh for an eckhart toll retreat it was the first time I've ever heard Eckhart Tolle actually quote Ken Wilber, um, which is just made me so happy because um, I just love that card. He's so sweet, but he has matured quite a bit in his message around the doing aspect of um, like embodied being. And so watching him mature as a teacher and a teaching has been really interesting. And one of the things that he talked about, um, when he referenced Ken, he was talking about sort of like the waking up and growing up both individually and also collectively. Um, and he was also talking about um, this fundamental need in the world today within um, our culture to have individuals that are so grounded in being that when these archetypes and when these large collective swells pull people in the conversation, that they can say purely in presence, but also deliver the relevant sort of uh, information or role that they can sort of do to elevate the conversation or to not get swept away in sort of these polarizing forces. And to me, that was a really interesting contribution in, uh, to um, kind of like where we're at today and seeing how Eckhart kind of saw it. And I feel like when, um, when you're talking about just sort of like staying grounded in these sort of polarizing forces. I, I sort of imagine like what would Hillary Clinton have been like if, you know, or some leaders like opposing Trump to sort of like just absorb all of his sort of like energy and just sort of be like, oh yeah, you're funny, but here, let me tell you something interesting. And, you know, sort of touch on these sort of wounds that Trump was able to sort of exploit to like pull all this energy and suck all of this sort of life out of everyone if we had like a really sort of, you know, enlightened sort of um, master, so to speak, that was uh, in the political realm, like what would that look like? And so Eckhart was playing with that idea a little bit as a group, but I thought, oh, that was, <laughs> that's quite interesting to imagine. So um, I feel a little bit of that sort of in this thread of conversation. Maybe I went off base, but I feel maybe a little bit that that's connecting with um, the question that you surfaced earlier, so. I think it is interesting to imagine. 
Um, I, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm. I lost my. I lost. I saw a little. I, I saw the, the uh, Lauren, your your son waving, and I got a little bit distracted. Um, but uh, I mean, one of the things, and this is a purely superficial, perhaps, but, or maybe more than superficial, but like aspects of Aurobindo that I feel is relevant, is that un- unlike a lot of other theorists uh like he had the life experience of a revolutionary he had the life experience of an anti-colonialist he had that um he, he passed through a period of uh opposing uh a um an oppressive force like a materially oppressive force in in india through the british empire uh and I think we need, there's also the other d- detail that he uh, was, I don't know how this works exactly, but doing psychic kind of warfare against Hitler. Like he recognized the threat of Hitler. And uh, although at that point could not, you know, uh, gather an army or something like that, he, he, he was involved with insurrectionist forces in, in India um, uh, in his earlier life, I understand. Uh, but he he was responding to it, uh, and I think that we need that too. And I think maybe Eckhart is saying that something like that. And and it has like how do you respond to like to Trump? Right? I don't want to make it's not about him, but it takes a different kind of consciousness. I think is what you're saying to actually kind of respond like and not to play a a game unconsciously that is um really not uh transcending the situation Uh, and so i'm interested in how one would do that for sure um how many would do that actually uh and uh, i i i think that part of maybe what our conversations have been moving towards is um, like I'm, I'm struggling to articulate this a bit, but it's, it's like that sort of freedom of movement in your mind, you know, like that, that uh, it's not just, it's not just a playfulness. It's not just a sort of superficial, like not taking something seriously because it's deathly serious. Uh, but we do tend, we, I just mean generally, culturally, and, and this is reinforced by the media cycles and the, the kind of feedback loops that that creates, we do tend to get sucked into states of mind, trance states, narrative, uh, um, you know, have balkanized kind of zones that um, really entrap us in, in, the, same, in the same cycles of, uh, of suffering and strife. And I'm very, I'm very interested in the fact that Aurobindo went to, you know, went to jail and in jail had profound realizations that like changed the course of his life and started something new. Like there, there's an attempt to start, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm going too far perhaps. Um, but I'm just, I'm resonating with what you're saying because I, I don't think this is an idle intellectual exercise. I, I think that our, our context matters our personal context matters and our social context matters. And so what we model here, what we enact here, uh, whether or not we can really calculate it or, or map it directly has an effect. And uh, I think we have the opportunity perhaps to have a beneficial effect, uh, an amplified effect uh, by virtue of, our, um, of the way that we do this. I found out recently that metaphors really kind of helped me articulate the an, an artic, an effable, I guess is a better word, but um, right now I'm thinking of a recent one I've been working on is hibernation. Um, and in a sense, jail time is a sort of hibernation. What we're doing here is a sort of hibernation where we're in a safe zone. We're away from 
the outside world unless we're sitting outside or in a nice patio area or something like that. But we're within a nice air conditioned space where we can do what we feel we want to do um, with our lives, which is focus on this, this reading group right now, learn more about each other. Um, and what drew me to Aurobindo in the first place was besides I went to a, a bookstore and the book literally fell, fell off the shelves and I picked it up and I was like, Oh, I recognize this. And um, so that might've been some magical occurrence, but there's, I, I learned that he did 24 years of silence or a vow of silence. This might be wrong. So maybe somebody like Matteo can correct me here, but, um, and I don't, he might've spent all that time writing or he might sit there and write to other people, but that's a sort of hibernation as well. And what I feel we need is a sort of hibernation away from a going underground away from what's out there right now. Not necessarily saying don't be an activist, don't, don't be a part of this, but um, that, that's how I see it. And that's what drew me to Aurobindo in the first place was this, this act of taking a time out of your life, a season maybe, to hibernate and really reflect on something. And this... This life divine came out of, um, along with two or three of his other major works, came out of a period of three or four years when he wrote. Mainly, it was just him writing for this publication called the Arya, or Arya, and just the sheer volume of what he wrote is baffling. Like, like uh, maybe it was Wendy mentioned, but just the fact that you can sit and write this is saying something about yourself or that the time you're in and um, to be able to get it out on paper. Uh, if, if you can imagine within three or four years publishing or even just sitting and writing a thousand pages in a journal or something like that, that's pretty amazing. But to actually be coherent about it is even more amazing. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but I, I feel, yeah, we need some sort of, Hibernation. I'd like to add a couple of things. Uh, John mentioned that Sri Aurobindo isn't disillusioned. And one thing that's always amazed me is this. Uh, yes, Doug, all of this all of his writings, except for Savitri, I mean, not almost all of his writings, came out serially in Arya between 1914 and 1921, which is when the world was at war. And then before, uh, and then when it was published in book form, it came out in 1948. So it was heavily revised as the world was at war. And for him to be able to, and, and something that, that Wendy said is really interesting, sustaining a meta narrative coming out serially, but then also as we, the, the first chapter, the human aspiration is like five pages long. The last two chapters, the Gnostic being and the divine life are like 70 pages long. He's, and you look at the, the last chapter, he's still starting with if this, then that. If this, then that. He's like bringing us through all of these uh, positions in a very, uh, I don't know, a very stable way. And uh, then not only did these they come out bef as the world was at war during both wars, which he called, World War II, he called the mother's war, they were both exerting a cult influence on the outcome of that, of that war. Um, but all of the, the writings in the Arya, he would start writing like the two days, two or three days before and virtually churn this stuff out without edits. 
<laughs> that's that that's just always it it always gets me to scratch my head and he, and he says a lot of it was coming clear audiently his mind was already completely learned how to completely silence his mind when uh when um when a, a yogi showed him this a yogi named lele came to him and showed him this in about 1911 and he did it for karma yoga he just wanted to be a better uh he wanted to be a better worker that's why why he uh why he got into yoga in the first place was that so he could be a more effective tool for the revolution. Uh, anyway, that's probably enough. If anybody else would like to make a comment, um, I think it should be the last one. And then we could talk a bit about logistics, uh, reading schedule, we can meet Lauren as well. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't have a response directly to any, anything that anybody has said, but I'm you know, sort of letting it linger in the space. Well, maybe I just, oh. sorry, go ahead. Uh, just on the political side, um, we do, we've had a fairly major event in Canada, maybe uh, at least uh, for West Coasters, um, with the uh, federal government bailing out um, the Texas oil company uh, that wants to um, expand the, the, the local oil line significantly. <clears throat> And eventually, and I guess eventually they've just, they managed to play it such that the government, our government's now come in and give them a huge amount of money uh, and taken over the project. So that's been a pretty, you know, in terms of, because I happen to live a five minute walk from where diluted bitumen would come up on the shore. Um, it's a big issue for me and, and for this area because we're right on the water around here. And then this happens to be a pipeline that would be right, you know, basically right in front of downtown Vancouver <laughs> and our shoreline. Um, so, yeah, so there was cer certainly some political stuff coming up for me around that um, and uh, trying to, I guess, discern how to respond to that uh, in a way that's sort of relatively clear because um, it could certainly get ego involved in it too, um, because it is sort of my backyard kind of thing. Um, yeah, so maybe Orbindo is kind of relevant on that side as well. Uh, maybe that has something to do with the evolutionary piece as well. So that's all I have to say about that. I just want to say as a um, fourth, I know, generation, yeah. fourth, fourth generation Texan, you know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> not that I feel responsible for our oil industry, but um, now I'm just curious about who the company is. Uh, it's um, in, it's a, a former Enron executives. No, no joke. But, oh, wow. Yeah. Hey, you, know, you know, they're always up to good things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I wanted to touch on one point that John uh, surfaced earlier in terms of sort of um, uh, more subtle uh, experiences and sort of how we not only have those experiences, make meaning of them, uh, share them with others. I had an experience recently, John, with a kid. Um, I got called in. I'm a, a Sunday school teacher for um, a local church here, and I'm on the sort of revolving roster. Long story short, um, never met this kid in my life. She was like 13 and she's been having out of body experiences during, um, when she plays music and all of these sort of like, you know, sort of psychic phenomena that she's quite, she's quite comfortable with, but she just doesn't talk about. And it sort of surfaced, uh, with me and another teacher sort of, she said some things. And so I kind of did a little bit of inquiry with her. And what you were saying made me wonder when you were talking about, you know, sort of the trauma of like not being able to sort of like feel like you, the experiences that you're having have sort of um, space to be articulated. 
And so I just wanted to sort of surface that and say, I think it's pretty rare that most kids have a supportive environment for those types of experiences or a way to make meaning or try and understand or sort of like wrap them into their more concrete experiences in day to day. And um, so, I, but I was a little bit also heartened to meet this kid and her sort of normalness and talking about these things and uh, I, I, I often wonder what would it be like if kids or people when they're having these experiences sort of like through childhood teenagehood etc were sort of not necessarily encouraged in the specialness so we try to just sort of normalize it and say yeah some people have those experiences and encourage her to sort of like you know talk about it and try and you know talk about how she made meaning of it but I wonder in sort of the wider context of this conversation sort of bringing in these other sort of subtle dimensions and experiences that aren't necessarily easy to sort of validate uh, in the same kind of ways um, and how that fits into the conversation of um, or of Endo's work. Because I don't really understand the, his body of work well enough to know where it fits in, but I think validating people's experiences at a young age for what they are and contextualizing them in a larger experience is probably really important in terms of people owning their power or their abilities or their gifts in a way that they contribute them into the world in whatever way they feel they're called to. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, you know, that just the, I think related to that and this last point, we could maybe move on to some next phase. Uh, maybe I'm just going to communicate this. I'll put it out, whatever becomes of it. But I think something about this has to do with developing like in that incubational space or in that hibernation space you talked about, Doug, uh, and the paranormal experiences, the other modes of perception, alternative ways of knowing, like it has to do with developing other kinds of powers uh, and um, capacities to, to be effective in the world, capacities to, to um, do things. And uh, I... Uh, I'm just going to leave it there. I mean, we can develop that, I, I think, in future talks. But it has something also to do with culture, too, like having a culture that uh, recognizes uh, what's occurring in somebody and is able to w welcome it, receive it, nurture it as, as ca uh, capacities develop in an individual or in a group. If we have a perspective on that, then I think that we could support it better. Uh, and so. Uh, if we're to, to to the degree that our intentions here converge, um, that may be one place where they they, might, they do. Uh, I think that there are probably going to be a number of other places. Um, but I think let we should probably begin talking about how we want to do this. Um, you know, we've been doing reading groups for the last couple of years. We have some experience, some kind of built up group knowledge, uh, but that's, you know, others are bringing in their own. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm sensitive to the limitations that we each might have with respect to how much we can read, how deeply we can go into a discussion, how much time we have, etc. At the same time, uh, I, there's a moment here and there's an opportunity like, to do something beyond which we might normally do. Uh, and so I, I'm, my original thought was to read the whole book and to do it uh, within this next phase of time before like the holidays and uh, uh, the, the, you know, the winter, the end of the year. Uh, and if we did that, it would be around 50 pages a week on average uh, chunking, chunking up the book by, you know, three to four chapters at a time and then less at the end. Uh, but I also, uh, other, <clears throat> others have voiced, um, other preferences or other ideas at least about how, about the pace, about like how much to take on in, in a given conversation. And I have some thoughts about, I've been noodling this, um, uh, because, I think we could do multiple things. There's enough people here that really having this many people in one conversation is not optimal. Uh, 
it just doesn't give each individual as much of an opportunity to talk and interact. Uh, so there is not there is the potential to have a few different groups going that may be having a may have a different focus, um, may be going at a different pace, uh, and may you know be trying different things, uh, not just reading and talking, but other kinds of exercises or experiments. I mean, this is part of the idea of Cosmos is to have a space where we could do experimental things and, um, and, and try things and report on them, communicate about them and build up, um, build up a collective knowledge, build up a, a, a sort of field. Uh, and that's, I'm serious about that. Like that's really what we're, what I want to do and what we've, I think have been doing. Um, but I don't exactly know how to do that. I, I think that for myself, just to put this out, I would like to read the full book by November or so. And I would, and I think that meeting on a weekly basis will maintain a certain focus and a certain momentum. And I think also that because of our backgrounds and because we've read other integral philosophers, other philosophers, psychologists, some of us come from the arts, um, and we're all, I think, good readers. Uh, if we could really use these sessions as opportunities to kind of go beyond, like to do something that is grounded in the text, responds to the text, tries to understand the text, but also works with us, works with the energies that we bring to it so that we're not subservient to squiggly black marks on, pa on paper, but are absorbing it and then transforming it through our own contemplation, through our own creative process, and then through our interactions. How that plays out in terms of a schedule, uh, um, I, I think I can make the commitment to being, to participating on a weekly call and to reading about 50 pages a week. Uh, and I want to also open it to other possibilities if something would work better for you. Uh, so um, are, any thoughts on on that and how we might best go about this. I, I would I would say let's go with that, Marco, and just see how it goes for maybe two or three sessions, and then we could have some evaluation space where we could, <coughs> now I think we could speed it up or slow it down, or let's do uh, next call, let's do something more experiential, or let's, if, an, if a group, if another, if there's a group of people in the same time zone who can coordinate it, they can, might want to get together and do something experiential and then report back. Um, I, I would be reluctant though to like split the group up too much because I think there's something, even if there's, I think th there's some stability that happens when there's enough people who show up consistently and then you get to know each other's patterns and get a feel for the dynamic. And then I think you could make that, that those kind of decisions um, more effectively than uh, I think we can do right now. For me, it'd be this is like a rehearsal what we're doing now. I read I read uh, about twenty five pages, but it's very easy to read, especially compared to Schlotterdijk. This is a breeze, <laughs> you know. But I don't think it's easy. But it's it's just Aurobindo's style is extremely direct in comparison to a lot of other philosophers. He's not playing language games. Uh, no, 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 no. But I do love. I do love Deleuze. I, I mean, I've been reading this one also, Banerjee's uh, take on uh, Aurobindo. I think that's an, another suggestion that you made, that we maybe one of, some of us could read these two books in tandem because he, he goes into postmodernism and Deleuze and um, you know, Foucault and Derrida. And I think those are interesting folks to study in relationship with with the with Arbindo because I think Banerjee sort of updates in some ways uh, Arbindo so those are those are my interests so I'm curious to know what other people want how they want to go about it but I'm a very I'm very fond of a close reading just going you know just a, a, a paragraph that you really like underline it and then read it out loud and you know chunk it down and then uh, correlate all those different kinds of close because we're all going to read it 
even if we do a close reading, we're going to read it in a different way. So I think that really supplements my own, own way of working. So mm. thank you. Thank yeah, you for that yeah. open yeah. question. Thanks, John. I completely agree with both of you and would like to see us go all the way through this, this book. Um, and I just want to make a couple notes that I'm learning how to use certain aspects of the site. I've been given a couple keys here and there on like uh, the Zoom account, um, uploading audio and things like that. So I'm, and I, I don't have an internet connection at my own home. I have a phone connection here, so I can't actually magically do a lot of things, but um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say I'll be available, which I'll post online at some point. I'll be available on Monday and Wednesday, basically the same time slot. At least the, I also have a newborn uh, four weeks ago, so there's quite a bit going on in my life. But um, so, but all it takes is the Zoom link. So if I'm thinking of random ideas, such if you want to read a chapter, just to have it there for somebody else to listen to. Um, if you're confused about something, um, then we can have a spontaneous kind of group that forms. If we have even a couple hours notice and somebody happens to be online, you can say, hey, let's both work on this together. Um, it, out. it can be with Life Divine. It can be outside of that. If somebody wants to read, I don't know how to pronounce Savitri, uh, like uh, Matteo said. but Savitri. Uh, Savitri. And Savitri. That, but there, there's Savitri. There's quite a bit of interest in many dynamic uh, the different dynamics of Aurobindo. So, um, yeah, don't, I don't want to see us limited to just, um, or pigeonholed in a certain way. If you feel you want to do something, then bring it up in the forum. If you can access the forum or send an email to somebody and we'll try to make it happen. And I'd like to make that happen for you. I personally don't necessarily feel I have, I, I feel even more of a beginner than Mateo. I, I've read the whole thing. I've read it maybe twice. And I don't know what I'm talking about. So I want to hear it from other people this, this time around to actually get something out of it. So, um, yeah, the group size is not an issue for me as I feel like I, I'll participate silently in some sort of way. But thank you. Okay, cool. So, all right, so we have a forum channel uh, dedicated to uh, this group. Uh, it's under the Metapsychosis, and it's... I think called Life Divine Aurobindo channel. So uh, you could create a post. Anybody here could create a post there to propose something, to ask a question, something you like from the book, a poem, Doug, <laughs> song, uh, dance. We don't only just have to, you know, talk. Um, I, I, I would love it if, you know, we just bring what, let come through what wants to come through and, and then, Doug, you and I can help, like, channel that and tech support it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, this is, I, I want to create culture. So that's why we're recording this, so people can watch it and then maybe respond to it in their own way. Like, it, perpetu it perpetuates it, 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 itself. Uh, I, I think that there's a continuity. Like, there's a direct, there's a lineage. And this is an expression, right, of, of, perhaps the same impulse that that inspired Aurobindo to write. Now we're, you know, doing this other crazy thing. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, yeah, invite you to, to bring it forth. And if you have any questions or if you want to do it, if, if you're not sure, you can private message us and ask. And, um, and I want to be as supportive as possible, uh, really. I really just appreciate you all be, being here. And, um, this is like multiplying, like you know, consciousness, like in <laughs> right here and now. Uh, it it really extends, I think, our our capacities to understand and see and perceive and communicate. So, um, the better we can do it, uh, the better. Now we have a couple of folks who joined us uh, in Medias Res in the middle of things. Uh, we started out with a, a little meditation, five minute meditation, and then we we all went around and did introductions where where we're coming from, what we're really some personal parts of what brings us here. Um, and so you may not have gotten all that context. 
Uh, but you maybe tune into the the discussion on like why Arbindo is relevant, why would we re, re, why are we reading this, how it relates. Lauren, uh, we've met before, I think, during the Gebsa reading, right? It's been a while. Oops, yeah, I think you're muted. I mean, sorry. And um, yeah, I've unfortunately keep up with that group, but I'm planning on keeping up with this one. So where are you? Um, I'm at my home in Laguna Beach, California. Um, this is my son, Aro. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, not directly named after Aro Bindo, but partially inspired by him. Aro Bindo. <laughs> 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 cool. Yeah, that's All right. right. Um, I went to the university, uh, I mean, the California Institute of Integral Studies, and that's where I was introduced to both Gebser and Arbindo. Um, and I'm excited to read it cover to cover. Like, I never have done that. I've read plenty of chapters within it, but I haven't gone all the way through. So. Cool. Um, all right. Well, yeah, I'm really glad you're joining us. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and then there's an iMac user. Uh, can you hear us? We can't see you. Could you um, want to try unmuting yourself and saying hi? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, great. Um, well, it's nice to see people here gathered around um, talking about Sri Aurobindo. I, I was in India years ago and read Adventures in Consciousness. And I still have that tattered copy and it meant a lot to me. And I was, you know, doing meditation retreats at the time and it all was a great um, um, steeping in, <laughs> I don't know, it was a great transformation really. Um, and it's always stayed with me. And so one reason this feels so great um, is it, it sort of comes full circle. It's stuff that has just kind of been working through me, but not something I could share with a lot of people for, you know, the past 30 years <laughs> directly anyway. So it's kind of thrilling. Um, and I haven't even been reading it, but you know, I've still been doing yoga and meditating and all, you know, like I said, it still all works with me and through me. So this is neat. That's cool. So what's your name? Ari. Ari. Uh-huh. Great. Um, so, well, will you be reading with us then? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, this was an introductory call, and we all introduced ourselves, and we talked a little bit about, you know, why we'd want to read this. Uh, but if you'd like, you can watch the recording of this will be posted on the forum at infiniteconversations.com, and you'll just see it there on the homepage. Uh, and yeah, you're welcome back. Uh, we're going to read through the whole book, apparently. Um, so the schedule, uh, uh, it, it, there's a logistics thread, and I'll copy the schedule from there and put it in, in a new place. I'm also setting up a calendar, so I'll share that link. Um, we may need to rework the writer's meeting um, if, if we're meeting at this time weekly, uh, but we can work that out later. Most of the folks there in that group are here as well. So... Um, I guess the plan is we're going to meet again next week and we're going to be reading the first, uh, I think, roughly 50 pages of the book. Uh, one thing that's worked well in the past is for, is to, is for each talk to have a different leader. They don't have to lead and organize the whole talk or host the whole talk, but to start things off and set a direction. And for and for that to to move around the group, so we get kind of get a flavor of uh, of what each person would want to bring to it, and really that could be a very simple summary of the text that we've read and some starting questions, or it could be something a lot weirder than that. Uh, and it's all okay. Um, would anybody like to volunteer to to lead us off next week? Yeah, Matteo? Okay. That, I think that's good. That would be good, actually. Uh, and um, great. So 
the tail will lead us off next week. I'll post the schedule, post the calendar, post the recording, and um, hope to see you all again. Uh, there were a couple of other people who were interested, so they may join in. And um, and like Doug was say was saying, uh, if you can't, if you're watching this and you can't make it at this time, let us know on the forum if you want to do something else. Maybe somebody would like to talk about. Um, uh, a section of the text with you or try something different. Uh, so that's what we're here for. That's what we're doing. And um, I'll, I'll mention this as well. That there's, we're not charging anything to participate in this. We do have an, uh, an account on opencollective.com, opencollective slash metapsychosis. And you could support the Metapsychosis Journal and Co Cosmos Cooperative, Infinite Conversations, these kinds of activities and the publishing that we're doing at opencollective.com slash metapsychosis. Uh, and, um, uh, and please do uh, join the forum if you haven't. And if you're there, participate. Love to, to, to see you there. So thank you so much. And um, see you next time. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Time. Bye. Say bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. Bye.